Welcome back. I'm Rick Hill with the Apostolate for Family Consecration, and we're joined here again as we go through the book Salvation is from the Jews uh, by Roy Showman, the author, and appreciate you being back again, Roy. In the uh, last, we ended the last episode with uh, the fact that did the, did the Jews complete their mission? And the chapter two is titled, How Well Did the Jews Do? So this is probably a good place to go back and say, you, you, you said they completed their mission, and yet they didn't recognize Christ. How do you reconcile they both? You can see them as having succeeded because they did what they were supposed to do, which was bring about the incarnation, spread the gospel throughout the world. But you can look at it as they failed because um, you know, they were Jesus' own people, and they didn't receive him when they came, and they rejected him and have been living a kind of um, orphaned religion ever since because Judaism was oriented towards bring about the coming of the Messiah and being transformed into its universal form, the Catholic Church after the Messiah came, and yet the Jews kind of missed the boat about their own religion. So you can look at it that way and say, well, they failed. So we give them a C. Well, you can give, <laughs> well, it's, that's what the whole point is. You can give them a D or you can give them an A, depending on how you look at it. So how do you reconcile those two? Um, which is actually going to be a theme throughout the series and is throughout the book. But uh, you can start by making the observation that um, throughout history, both human history and also biblical history, throughout the, the Bible itself, it seems that God always expects the vast majority of mankind to fail him and to bring blessing to all of mankind and redemption to all mankind, not because of the averages and the majority vote, but because of a faithful remnant, because of a very few who are truly pleasing to God. Now, we saw that when we talked about Abraham and God's giving blessing to the whole Jewish people because of the virtue of Abraham. We see it um, throughout. We see it in, in the, f the first time that God gave up on mankind, right, was in the days of Noah. And he was going to wipe out all of mankind from the face of the earth and start over again. Sometimes I wonder why he didn't, but anyway. <laughs> Um, but he, he spared mankind, essentially, for the, you know, he had one righteous man, Noah, and he preserved his family, and then his family became um, the ancestors of all of subsequent of mankind. So he, he saved creation as he had created up to that point for the sake of Noah. Uh, in the days of Abraham, God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of their horrible sin. And Abraham goes before God, and he says, are you, you know, what if there are 50 righteous men in Sodom? Will you destroy those 50 righteous men because you want to destroy everyone else? And God says, no, you're right. I'll spare all of Sodom and Gomorrah if there are 50 righteous men. And Abraham, being the uh, prototypical Jew, negotiates him down to <laughs> five, 10 righteous men, right? Right. And finally he says, what about for the sake of 10? Will you destroy them, those 10, you know? And God says, no, I'll spare all of Sodom and Gomorrah if there are 10 righteous men there. And by the way, uh, Jewish, Jewish liturgical prayer needs 10 men to be valid, to have the group prayer, and that is still, it's called a minion. And as a matter of fact, um, when I was growing up, if, if in synagogue service there weren't 10 men who showed up, the rabbi would literally go out onto the street and try to call or somebody and drag him in because he needed a minimum of 10. And that is still hearkening back to Sodom and Gomorrah, and if there were 10 righteous men, God will send his graces for the sake of those 10 righteous men. Because I always wondered why he didn't keep negotiating, and now, now I we know. know. <laughs> um, but so, um, you know, this, this idea of a faithful remnant being what saves mankind. Um, so you can look at the Jews that way, and there was a faithful remnant, there was a remnant, there was a minority who did follow Christ, and not only followed Christ, but were all of the early Christians, virtually all of the early Christians, right? Pentecost, when Peter preaches at Pentecost and, and 3,000 join the church, um, the Acts of the Apostles makes very clear that those 3,000 were Jews from throughout the world and proselytes, you know, convert, converts to Judaism. They, they weren't Gentiles. Right. So there, there was that faithful remnant. And in um, the Revelation, in Catholic Revelation, we see over and over again the same explicit teaching about the faithful remnant when um, the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to the children at Fatima, uh, or I think it was actually when the angel of Portugal appeared to the children at Fatima. He told them 
that their prayers were important for saving all of Portugal from the worst of the um, World War I. Um, over and over again in the uh, Divine Mercy apparitions to St. Faustina, Jesus told her in a number of ways that for your sake I will spare Poland the worst of the destruction. You know, for your sake I will bless the entire country and so forth. And these were both prophesied in advance. That's where uh, Cardinal Luigi Chiappi, who has done a lot, had done a lot of work with our apostolate, had said Fatima was the greatest um, public, mir public revelation, public miracle since the resurrection, in that uh, it was proclaimed in advance, prophesied in advance, it was witnessed by uh, a non-Christian press that covered it. So what was the message? And that's where our apostolate focuses on Fatima. So I was... I, uh, enjoyed reading that part of your book and seeing you, you point that out that uh, it was really the prayers of those three children that spared Portugal uh, from the destruction of the war. Uh, as, 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 as long as you highlight Fatima, let me give a little um, digression, which is Fatima was very important in my own conversion because in that year between the um, my experience of Christ, I know now that it was Christ, I didn't know at the time, mm -hmm. on the beach, in my experience of the Blessed Virgin Mary, when I came back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I was living after that experience of Christ, and I didn't know who it was, and I wanted to pursue this experience and find out more about this real God who showed himself to me. Um, here I had a mystical experience, and what do you do if you have a mystical experience? You find a mystic to tell you more about it, right? It was a very <laughs> imprudent thing to do. So I found this mystic who was a fallen away Catholic, and I went over to his apartment hoping that he could explain what had happened to me and I could know what religion to follow. Well, wh what he explained was all wrong and the books he gave me, he was into the New Age, he was into this like Hindu guru, all this horrible stuff and I went down that path which was terrible. But he, had, um, he was a fallen away Catholic and on his coffee table he had a book called something like The Hundred Greatest Miracles of Modern Times. And at one point in the evening he went in the kitchen to make some tea for us and I leaf through this book, and my eyes fall on one page dedicated to the miracle of Fatima. Now, I was at this point about 30 years old. Um, I had, uh, you know, been educated out my ears, right? I had probably spent about 26 years in school, and nobody had ever told me about Fatima. And I read this one-page description of the miracle of Fatima. My head's exploding, right? And this guy comes out from the kitchen. His name was Bob. And I, I point to the book, and I say, is this really true? Did this really happen? And he said, yup. And um, I said, has anyone else ever heard of it? Because I had never heard of it. He said, oh yeah, you know, all Catholics know it. And I said, uh, is anything else more written about it than this one page? And he said, oh yeah, go to the public library, you'll find a dozen books on Fatima. My initial reaction was furious indignation. So how could this have been kept secret from me all my life? I if I had known this, my whole life would have been different. My total complaint in, in Hebrew school growing up, religious instruction, was why did God used to perform miracles in the days of the Old Testament but stop? I felt like if I had known that God was still performing miracles, my entire view of the world would have been different. And so how can, how can I'm preaching to the choir, but you know, for, for Catholics who know about these miracles, as you say, witnessed by 70, 80,000, 100,000 people, including atheists, communists, and so forth, how can they keep them secret? How come they, you know, it's a wonderful means of evangelization. We're living in this pseudoscientific age that's looking for proof for everything, and the Catholic Church has the proof, has the proof of the existence of God, has the proof of the truths of the Catholic Church, in part through the miracles. I think that all of these physical miracles that have come to light in our day, like Fatima, like the scientific investigation into the Shroud of Turin, and so forth. God always knew that the 20th century, the 21st century, science would dominate, everyone would want proof, everyone would want evidence, and he provided these miracles to give us a new means of evangelization, a new, a new form of evidence. And that brings a, a great point of our need to evangelize. Because I, as well, when I first heard of Fatima, I said, why haven't I been told this before? Why isn't this being played at 6 o'clock on every news station to, to change the world? But yet you, you call in the book, and you've, you've pointed it out here. We need to get out and, and be that faithful remnant that we were just talking about, to spread the message of Fatima, uh, that people will see the true God and, and come back to the faith. Yeah, that's right. So um, uh, um, the, I guess we got on to that 
talking about the fact that there were some Jews who were a faithful remnant at the time of, of Christ, um, but the vast majority of Jews probably rejected Christ and continued with their Judaism. But there's a blessing that still remains on the Jewish people, um, in part because, as St. Paul says, because God's uh, calling is irrevocable, and when God made that promise to Abraham and to his seed forever, it meant his seed forever, so that election probably continues on that basis, if you but could. also because he blesses, he, uh, blesses the many for the sake of the few and uh, the disciples and the apostles and the early Christians, you know, were Jews. And also, by the way, of course, the Blessed Virgin Mary is a Jew, right? So she's right. probably still got a tender spot in her heart for the Jewish people. If you could here, perhaps talk about covenant, because you've talked about the covenant with the Jews and the promise with the Jews, and it would probably be a good idea to go ahead and, and talk about the word covenant. It's not a contract, and there are the differences so that perhaps we'd get a better understanding of exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point because, because um, uh, things get confused very quickly when you're looking into this relationship between the theology of Judaism or the theological relationship between Judaism and the Catholic Church. Because on the one hand, you know, I am making the statement and I'm supported by, by St. Paul that the election of the Jews continues. But on the other hand, the entire sacramental system for salvation and for the redemption of sins, which God established in the Old Testament, has been abrogated, has been replaced by the Christian sacramental system, by the Catholic Church. We know this. Um, in the Old Testament, God gave the Jews uh, a tremendous set of laws. I mean, uh, Jews consider there to be 613 commandments in the Old Testament that they have to <laughs> follow to be faithful to God. Now, some of those commandments have to do with ritual purity, rules about what you can eat, what you can't eat, who you can touch, who you can't touch, what fabrics you can wear, what fabrics you can't wear, and so forth. And many of those laws um, are related to the animal sacrifice, sacrificial system for the redemption of sins. Now, we know that that um, sacrificial system, animal sacrifice for the redemption of sins, was first of all, it was only a foreshadowing or placeholder for the true sacrifice that would redeem our sins, which was the death of Christ on the cross. And um, we know that that sacrificial system was clearly ended around the time of the crucifixion. We know it as Christians from the Christian faith itself and uh, the New Testament, right, that, that uh, at the time of the crucifixion, the, the uh, curtain in the temple was rent in two, and if anyone's seen the movie The Passion of the Christ, right, the pillars of the temple, um, you know, get torn apart and the ceiling comes crashing down as a sign that, that God has left the temple and the sacrificial system has ended. And if you didn't want to believe it on the basis of the Gospels or Mel Gibson, you could believe it on the basis of history itself, because not very long afterwards, in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed and never rebuilt. So the temple was the only place where animal sacrifice could be performed to bring about the remission of sins, but it couldn't be performed after 70 AD because there was no temple. So clearly, the Jewish sacramental system was ended with the coming of Christ, but that doesn't mean that the entirety of the covenant with the Jewish people was ended. Their election was continued even though their sacramental system was ended. And, and if you don't separate those two, you'll be in a state of confusion about whether the Jews are still the chosen people or not, and so forth. By their election, we're talking about a family bond that was formed between the Jewish people and God. That, yes, and a promise. Right. And a promise. And this isn't just um, me talking. As, as you know, uh, especially our current Holy Father right. has spoken very powerfully on the continuation of the election of the Jewish people. Um, St. Paul, um, uh, St. Paul talks about in Romans 11, um, the, uh, let me see if I can quickly enough flip to it. Um, here, he says, it's very beautiful. It's in the end of Romans 11. He's talking about the Jews, and he says, um, as regards the gospel, there are enemies of God for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. 
So we have it in sacred scripture. The, you know, they, are, they remain, as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. So that's a pretty unambiguous statement, that the election continues. They're the enemies of God for their rejection of the gospel. In other words, there is something very wrong there, but that has not taken away their election. And um, I don't know if you'll indulge me, if I can quickly enough find some quotes. Please. John Paul II. As and you're looking for those, I, I um, have heard Dr. Scott Hahn talk quite a bit about a covenant and the difference between a covenant and a contract. And I think a lot of times we, um, we look at this more from a contractual standpoint and that they failed, but yet we're not looking at it from a, from a covenant standpoint where contract being exchanging goods and services and covenant being a new family relationship, a marriage or an adoption. And so, so God literally made them his people, part of his family. And when we think about it in those terms, God would not have taken back that, that family relationship. He hates divorce, right? Yeah, exactly. He hates exactly. divorce. Uh, he wouldn't have divorced the Jewish people. Now, no one has spoken more powerfully than, than the Holy Father, Benedict XVI, in particular when he was Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, about the election of the Jews. So let me read a few quotes. This is from Reconciling a Gospel and Torah from 1996 of, of the Holy Fathers, or of then Cardinal Ratzinger's. Um, all nations, without the abolishment of the special mission of Israel, become brothers and receivers of the promises of the chosen people. See, so what God has done is he has, he has raised up the, the Gentiles, the whole world, to the status of the chosen people without eliminating the status of the chosen That's people. That's a great point because we think of they missed the Messiah and they fell, but we were actually raised up to that level. You make that point in the book and I... Uh, I appreciated that. So. And, and there's um, something connected to that with which the, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger said in, um, in God in the World in, in 2001, which is, um, this is like really, as a Jewish Catholic, particularly interesting to me, um, that the Jews are connected with God in a special way and that God does not allow that bond to fail is entirely obvious. Okay, so he doesn't allow that bond to fail. You could say the Jews are doing everything possible to make that bond fail. And they certainly, their role in the crucifixion of Christ is about, you know, as, as horrible a thing as one can imagine, to, uh, if they were almost like trying to force that bond to fail. But God, because he's faithful on his end to his promises, does not allow that bond to fail. And then the, uh, Ra uh, Cardinal Ratzinger continues, we wait for the instant in which Israel will say yes to Christ, but we know that it has a spe special mission in history now, which is significant for the world. So even in their fallen state of rejection of Christ, they're fulfilling a special mission in the world, even today, even awaiting their conversion. And that's a, uh, a great point you make in the book in terms of um, how he has held them up all this time. And even under um, such attacks from the adversary, which we'll get into in later shows. But maybe we could go back now and you could share um, some of the, the laws and the uh, rituals from the Old Testament. Um, I know I'd be interested to yeah. hear. No, I was thinking that that, that would be a, a very valuable thing to do. As I, as I mentioned, there are sort of two sets of laws that appertain to the Jews in the Old Testament. One is a set of laws around animal sacrifice for the remission of sins. That's been obviated. Um, the other set of laws is around ritual purity. Now, um, there are many, I mean, obviously Jews have um, generated a lot of animosity towards them through history, and there's been a lot of animosity that they haven't deserved. But um, if one looks at the Jewish community, especially the religious Jewish community, you see that they keep themselves apart, they uh, eat special food, they, they very often dress in a special way. Um, they are, for instance, by Jewish law, men are prohibited from um, physical contact with women, not their wives. I mean, even like shaking hands and stuff. And obviously, if you reach out your hand to shake somebody's hand and they kind of draw back, it's not a way to ingratiate yourself. So people can look at all of these laws that, or, or all of these tendencies of Jews or this Jewish community to keep itself separate and say, well, they're just like elitist and arrogant and you know, think they're superior and how obnoxious. But if you look at the Old Testament, you see all of that behavior flows directly from the laws that God gave them. 
Because obviously, you know, if you're not allowed to eat with non-Jews, if you're not allowed to touch non-Jews, um, it's going to have the effect of, of separating the community. Now, in the days of the Old Testament, in that time between the uh, election of Abraham and the coming of Christ, the Jews had to be kept separate by a set of rigid laws because they were a nomadic people, you know, tra you know in, in the part of the world where these tribes were con continually moving around, intermarrying with other tribes, mingling with other tribes, and losing their national identity, losing their ethnic identity. And God had to somehow give them a mechanism for staying separate for 2,000 years. They had to, I mean, he had to build walls around them. Now, my argument is that you can look at um, those set of ritual purity laws in the Old Testament as having been designed by God in part to keep the Jews separate, precisely so that they wouldn't intermingle. And one can also even speculate that maybe God made the Jews kind of elitist and exclusionary as a way of, in their personality, putting in a mechanism for keeping them separate. So again, you don't have to think of them as entirely culpable for these, these tendencies or these traits. You can simply say that they, they had a purpose that they had to serve until the coming of Christ, and they lost that purpose after the coming of Christ, but you, you know, they're not aware of that, and, and the mechanisms are still there, and that's what we're seeing today. And, and we try to view everything through a 21st century Western world lens, but yet, as you point out in the book, you were dealing with, well, I was going to say you were dealing with a pagan world, but maybe it's the same lens. You, you were dealing with a pagan world that God had to separate them for, from in order to form them to bring about the Messiah. So a lot of the things that we read in the Old Testament and, and were horrified when, when God said, go into the land of the pagans, slaughter the pagans. This was because they weren't formed enough yet to actually avoid the pagan practices. That's right. That, that, well, I mean, it is, it is horrifying, but that if, if you have no choice, that, that was God commanding them to do it. And God had his reasons, and um, sending the Messiah was the most important thing in creation, actually. It was the redemption of the whole world. So perhaps God had to take rather draconian measures to protect the Jewish nation from um, being too polluted um, to bring about the coming of the Messiah. And with the animal sacrifices, we have the same thing. They had been taken from Egypt, and the animals they were being asked to sacrifice were the, the previous gods of Egypt. It was trying to separate them from that, those that's, gods. That's, that's one, one part of the equation. Yeah, it has been pointed out that um, the, uh, there was a relationship between the particular form of the sacrifice and a kind of um, severance from the Egyptian pagan gods. Um, but I'm always a little bit loath to overinterpret um, God's actions because I don't want to have to answer to him for it. <laughs> that would be prudent. Well, I think we're at the end of another show, so we thank you for joining us and uh, hope that you're reading this book. Uh, this is uh, one of the best books I've ever written, and my wife was surprised when I said that because I've read quite a few books. But it, it really has a lot of enlightenment. So we're trying to take this at a chapter at a time, so don't look at the book and get intimidated by its size. Take this a chapter at a time, read with us, come back, and let's let Roy unpack that. So next week we'll be going into the next chapter. So you've only got one chapter to read, and then we can unpack that as we move forward. Looking at the salvation is from the Jews, uh, God's covenant with the Jewish people, and, and how it's affecting us today. Thank you for joining us.